Okay, so this, um, let me just give the broad outline, I mean, what I, my, uh, uh, I, I apologize for bad, some bad handwriting, and my hand has had some problems. So if I scribble a little bit, do stop me and ask me what I've written there. Okay, so sometimes in the, in the excitement, and I mean, I might just, I mean, draw, write some things properly. Okay. So the outline, I first, it's a, uh, I, I want to do basic root, root systems and such stuff. Root systems, affine roots. Um, alcoves, parahorics, at a very basic level. And then I want to just go to some, some Fuchsian groups. Ramified covers. of Riemann surfaces. And or unit groups, what I call unit groups, we'll discuss these things. And some, some Bruha tips, group schemes. Then third would be discuss um, parahoric torsos on Riemann surfaces. So let me just do X here. And fourth, some new directions, new applications of these ideas uh, towards the question of degeneration. Question of um, the generations of moduli of principal G bundles and I mean. <coughs> It's, I hope I can cover uh, all this. So I'm going to do, I mean, I'm not an expert in Bruhartich theory in any sense of the term, so I won't be working, I mean, one could work in, with a non archimedean field and uh, everything is, should be done in that general setting, but I would like to stick to a very basic thing, and especially since it's a course, I do things, I'll do this at the very, very simple, Level, I'll fix my base field to be the field of complex numbers. My A will be CZ or CT, I don't know, maybe CZ. K will be here, the Laurent series. And my maximal ideal will be Z. I'll fix the uniformizer here. and. Yes. And my group G, so this will be my field with evaluation here. And G will be very, the sim, very sim, it's a simple, not very simple, it's simple, simply connected, what is called almost simple. Okay, this is simply connected, and one could in general, think of, if one is not very really happy with an abstract group, think of SLM. Uh, if one doesn't mind, think of the exceptional groups, P6, uh, all these things. Okay. <clears throat> Let me fix some notations. So I'm not going to do Bruhatich theory in the very general setting. So in some sense, I'm going to fix what is called an apartment. Uh, and work in that scenario. More, more general Bruatich buildings are constructed out of these apartments by gluing, and uh, one doesn't require all that for the 
the final goal that I wish to reach. So I fix a maximal torus. T, I also fix what is called a Borel. And these are the standard, if you look at G to be GLN or SLN, this is the, the upper triangular matrices, the diagonal matrices here. And I'll have the notation XT, which will be just uh, this is just the multiplicative group this here, and YT one parameter subgroups. Co-characters, okay. So I want to use this basic notations here and do some root system theory at a very basic level. But this, so I work with my, my notation would be E would be the vector space which is the real vector space, which is yt tensor r, <coughs> okay, and, and its dimension is the number l, which will later on get connected to what is called the, the rank of the group. And I also have, uh, I fix, fix a positive definite Scalar product denoted by this on E. And so this gives an identification of E with E star, the dual here, and therefore a scalar product on the dual. <coughs> and this E star will get identified in this notation. And for every, for every alpha in E star, okay, <clears throat> so let alpha check belong to E be the image of uh, two alpha by alpha. alpha. <clears throat> I'm thinking of alpha as a linear functional. And I denote by H alpha, the kernel of the alpha. And uh, let S alpha be reflection, reflection by the hyperplane H alpha. <clears throat> so explicitly, S alpha of an X will be x minus 2 times x alpha by alpha alpha and alpha. Okay. So the definition, the root system, the root system R in the real vector space E star is a subset The subset <clears throat> plus some axioms. So I'll call these axioms RS1, 0, R, this kind of negative RS, and R spans E star. So, I mean, I'll, there are, uh, I need this language, so I'm just writing them on the board. 
please stop me if there's any questions, notations or anything. RS2, so I'll denote my roots with the English letter R sometimes. Some, I'll keep the alphas and all for so-called simple roots as they come up later. <clears throat> and uh, so I want, so I should have written there that um, there is these simple reflections can be made to act on, uh, can be made to act on E star, the translations. Okay, so if I think of, so I can, I'm just saying that um, S alpha acts on E star by, by S alpha on a, on a B to be decomposed with S alpha. Okay. So for this, I want this to be equal to R for every and R is three. I mean, there are several ways of defining this. I'm choosing one approach to do this. If it implies that R S check belongs to C. And we assume that R is what is called a reduced root system. In fact, since I've assumed that G is simple and simply connected, those assumptions will automatically come into force. I am not dwelling too much on, I mean, this. the best place to look for all this is Burbaki. And I have RS4. I just want to do enough to be able to talk about things. R, if R and S, if R and S are proportional, then R is plus minus S. <clears throat> and R is five, which is a consequence here, this is R is irreducible as a root system. That means if R is R1 union R2, plus that R1, R2, to zero for every ri in ri, then r1 or r2 is empty. So these elements of r are called the roots. Okay, basic objects in this whole theory and the group the group and w generated by the simple reflections by the reflections s alpha alpha in r is a, a finite group is a finite group of isometries of the vector space E and called the, the while group of the root system. And the connected components the connected components C of <coughs> Union. You have a planes here are open simplicial cones <coughs> called the chambers. And these are permuted transitively by, by simply transitively by the action of W. 
Okay. And the closure. The closure C bar is a fundamental domain. Fundamental domain uh, for W. Okay. It's kind of a tessellation. I don't know, maybe it's just opening up into chambers of that kind and it acts. These are the coset representatives here. So choose one. 1C, I'll just call it C. Choosing, it, choosing this, I mean, I am basically made a choice in some sense. I fixed this maximal torus and this boreal in my group's scenario here. In some sense, this data already chooses a wild chamber here. And so that's what I've done there. And this, it determines a, a set S inside R so of L roots, L being the dimension of the vector space E, such that C is the intersection, C is the intersection of the open half spaces of enough spaces x in E, <coughs> so that alpha x depends here. So I'm just trying to say that, I mean, we have these connected components, the closures, and the connected components, choice of one determines a choice of the set S and vice, and in fact, the converse will also be true. And so I just want to say equivalently, Equivalently, S, a choice of the subset S, I mean, is called a base of the root system if it is a basis of the vector space E, E star, and, and each root, each root can be can be written <coughs> as beta summation m alpha alpha integral linear combination. And with the, such that, oh, I can't go here. Okay. Such that all the, uh, the m alphas have the same sign. <coughs> so positive or negative, that is all m alphas in that case, non negative or, or, and these conditions, so elements of S are called simple roots. The simple roots and this, it determines the set of positive roots. Alpha, so that. And the negative roots are, the negatives are the positive roots, okay. So each base, determines a unique wild chamber. So those are called the wild chambers. So each base S determines a unique C and vice versa. And I can also talk about um, the height of a root to be summation M alpha. <coughs> So this was a 
quick review of the definitions. And maybe I'll. Uh, <clears throat> so I want to say that um, G is simple. G is we started with something simple. <coughs> I mean, actually, very very generally, it's true. The the joint representation. And just remark the yeah, joint representation, okay, uh, which is irreducible. Which is irreducible has a highest highest weight <laughs> and a unique has a unique uh, highest weight here, and this is called. The, the weight of the representation will be actually a, a root. So this will be called the highest root. I mean, I can, I'm saying it exists here. All I'm trying to say is it's highest in the following sense. Usually I'll denote it by alpha naught here. So this will be, um, there is a unique highest root here. I'll just call it mi alpha, alpha i here. Yes, and with the property, yeah. Oh, white chalk. Okay. So, I'll, is it better? Okay. I'll just denote it by mi alpha i. So, maybe I'll just put the coefficients mi alpha naught alpha i. And the property of this highest root is that mi of alpha naught is bigger than or equal to mi of alpha for every alpha in r. r plus. So this is a property. And in particular, mi of alpha naught are all bigger than or equal to 1. Because, because uh, mi of alpha naught is bigger than or equal to mi of alpha i, which is okay. So this this special root alpha naught has special properties. Uh, which is quite remarkable in its, I mean, what it contains, its information, its coefficients. Have, uh, have, I mean, not deep content. Okay, so in the, in the following sense, for example, example, so if you take, uh, the so-called Coxeter number of G, usually denoted by HG. This is summation mi alpha naught plus one. And this number is usually, in, I mean, this is also in dimension G. This, this number L is called the rank of the, what I've defined there is the rank, this dimension of E, and also the number of simple roots so this number L is called the rank of this <coughs> root system. And this, or this group G, so this is rank G minus one. <coughs> okay. And uh, I just want a few more properties. Okay. Four, five. Yeah. Yeah, 
I just want to have just one small statement. There's something called the Carta matrix. Of uh, R relative to S. So that is matrix which is which should be written as N alpha beta, alpha beta in S, where N alpha beta is alpha beta check. Two times alpha beta, a beta beta. Okay, and we can observe that this is, by the way, I've written this. This is W invariant. Okay. So with this uh, out of the way, I just want to. Um, get to <clears throat> so well, I, as I said my main goal is to discuss these arahoric groups in the simplest situation and the the idea of beginning with Iwahori Matsumoto and then Bruha Tits is to work not with these roots but what are called affine roots so let's um, so let's have some notations here. So I just wanted to say uh, fine rules. Oh, it's a mess here. Yeah. Ah, okay, there we are. Right. For every R in R and then in Z. We have an affine linear functional. Yeah, the, the roots were linear functions on E. So I have affine linear functionals which I denote by uh, uh, R comma N E to R, which sends a vector V to RV translated by the integer N. So these are functionals, okay, affine functionals, and the, the elements, the elements uh, I don't know, this letter should be uh, I don't know, theta, I don't know, what are, okay, let's call them theta, theta rn, r in r, n in z, this these are the so-called affine roots. Affine roots. And I can now look at the hyperplanes given by the vanishing of these. And these are the affine hyperplanes. Affine hyperplanes. And <coughs> And um, I also have these, again, reflections. So let S, R, N be reflection in these hyperplanes, H, R, N. And I have this group, W, F, which is the group generated by these affine reflections. <coughs> Okay, it's uh, an infinite group. Of uh, displacements of E. Okay, and this the standard while loop. So notice that when I take n to be zero, it is just the usual roots here. So this W inside, I can think of W sitting inside W uh, WF as the subgroup fixing the origin. So this, I mean, in the usual setting, we have a map from W F to W, but it also comes with a splitting. It's w, the affine while group is a semi-direct product. <coughs> and you can see the, the standard while group as the stabilizer in this case.
<clears throat> so um, I, I also look at the following. Um, the, oh, maybe I should say something about the alcoves here. Yeah. The connected components. The connected components. The connected components of E minus union HRN now uh, are open L simplices. Open L simplices called alcoves. Okay, and permuted by the affine while group. Okay, there's an action acting. And the closure of an alcove. Maybe I should have called this open alcove and closure. The fundamental alcove is is a fundamental domain for the affine while group. Is the AC not working or am I sweating too much? So I've, I've written a lot. I hope, uh, I mean, it's standard stuff, but I just need the, uh, the notations for this. And each X. <clears throat> so the, so I can talk about facets and I'll come back to that, yeah. Okay, so this, once I've fixed this, um, so this, I'll denote this, Alcove, and this is nothing but the union, the intersection of um, these half spaces. So this is usually called the while alcove, like the while chambers there. Okay. So these alcoves are sitting inside the chamber, given by. The simple roots. So if I fix my set of simple roots, I have this canonically defined while chamber here, and this will be sitting inside it. It will be an alcove inside the chamber. Can you describe an example? Uh, Pardon? Uh, can you give an example? I'm going to give an example in detail. So I just want this notation, and then I want to, it's best the, to take the example of G2. <laughs> so I'll just do that, because that's one example which one can, reasonably complicated and reasonably simple also. I mean, if I don't have all this, these letters in place, then the, I won't be able to talk about the example. <laughs> okay. So I, I just want to develop a little more, and then I, in, at length tell you what's happening in the G2 case. Okay. So I have this basic affine roots. I'll call them the zero L. These are the, the simple roots, the standard ones. And this one, zero, is um, correctly speaking, it is minus alpha naught plus one, which is minus summation. I'll, maybe I should have a notation uh, for the highest root. I'll just denote this by ni alpha i. So these ni's are the special coefficients. I mean, these are, th these coefficients n i, which are this importance here. So I'll just call this n i eta i plus one. So this is the, the extra uh, affine root which has been added with respect to the highest, highest root here. And the property is that summation n i eta i, i going from Zero to L is actually one, but I take N zero to be one. So this implies, in particular, that all theta j's <coughs> do not vanish simultaneously. <sighs> right, right. Okay. Let me also. Take, uh, spend a little more time with the abstraction, a few more minutes, and then, so let M be a subset of zero to L and define the facet 
facets coming from of the of the alcove here to find the facet we call it fm theta belonging to a such that theta equal to 0 relatively j not in m okay facet of just a facet if it's in english yeah And to each, to each FM, each facet, associate this, like the the Coxeter number, associate the index HM, the summation NJ, J belonging to M. Okay, and I mean, what, I I apologize for the, the the whole routine, but I mean, I this is the nature of this subject. I just need at least some idea. I'm going to look at these various facets of this while alcove and fix something like a, a weighted barycenter for all these, and they will be the representative points whose stabilizers. I'm interested in looking at, which will contain the standard set of parahorics. You know, I mean, if people are familiar with the usual um, root system and parabolic subgroups for every subset of 1 to L, <coughs> I can define the so-called parabolic subgroup defined by that. And up to conjugacy, there are only finitely many of these parabolics defined by the subsets of the <coughs> simple roots coming from the Dinkin diagram. Here, we would like to think of them in this special case as coming out of the so-called extended Dinkin diagram. And I want to look at the specific uh, marked points where the information is more easy to handle for reasons which we'll see in our theory as we go ahead. Yeah. So just quickly, uh, <clears throat> so I want to say mm, I have a weighted barycenter, a weighted barycenter I'll call it theta m in A for these facets defined by, by the equations um, theta i of, I don't know, maybe this should be called, I don't know, psi i, I don't know, equal to one, 1 by h m for i in m. And note that j of theta m if zero, if J doesn't belong to M, because M belongs to the facet. <clears throat> okay. My facet is defined by these conditions. <clears throat> okay, and there's a way of indexing the vertices of the while alcove. I'll index them like this. These are also the, uh, the smallest dimensional facets here. The vertices of the while well, alcove, I'll index them as 0 and theta alpha j, where this is the so called alpha j star by the coefficients, this nj, the highest root coefficients, j going from 1 to l. So these are special choice of vertices that I'm making, as we'll see in the special example where these alpha j star are the, the uh, fundamental weights. Okay. And with this, um, you can write the barycenter as Ni by Hm theta alpha i. Okay. So with this out of the way, let me now get to one example. And the, sorry, sorry, sorry. So I was, uh, I was trying to tell the equations for the barycenter. And then I wanted to define the vertices of the while alcove purely in terms of uh, the, I mean, I'm making a special choice 
in the, in the manner in which I have defined the while I'll go by the equations, these vertices turn out to be the origin of my vector space and special points given by these uh, alpha j star by nj, the nj's are the coefficients of the highest root, as we'll see in the example that I have. <coughs> so let's, I'm going to work out one example which I have learned, which is a, you know, these root systems, uh, there are the, the two-dimensional root systems. <coughs> there are four. G2? Yeah. Before that, you do like SL3 or something which you have already the, or, uh, We can do SL3, but G2 has a, will have a more interesting to see what, SL2 can be worked out as an exercise and we can take it up tomorrow. Because I, the, there are these, I mean, uh, the, uh, there's a long route and a short route which comes here, which makes it a little more interesting. And you also will, the SL3 is too symmetric, too nice. I mean, in some sense, each of these so-called vertices will be hyper-special. Here, there are some interesting features. So in a given short, I mean, this sort of, <laughs> we'll, I'll, uh, I'll leave the SL, uh, the SL in case as an exercise. We can always come back to see it tomorrow morning. <laughs> With this as a base example. And also, I mean, I've, since I've worked it out, it'll be easier for me to write it. <laughs> okay, root system of rank two has a, so this has two root lens. The lens, because I've got an inner product, I can talk about the lens. And the alpha one is the short root. And alpha 2 is the long root. Okay. And all the other roots are positive roots. Are alpha 1 plus alpha 2, alpha 2 plus 2 alpha 1, alpha 2 plus 3 alpha 1, and then 2 alpha 2 plus 3 alpha 1. This is alpha naught, the, the highest root. <coughs> And the Coxeter number, Ng in this case is 6, 3 plus 2 plus 1. <coughs> and you can draw this standard diagram, this for this the root vectors here, this is alpha 2. plus alpha 2, alpha naught, which is 2 alpha 2 plus alpha So this is the picture in xt tensor r, and we think of we will we have to work on the dual space. So this is my y t tensor r. I want to think of them the functionals here, functionals on this. <coughs> The matrix in this case is uh, simple to write down, 3 and 2 and minus 1, minus 1 on this guy. <clears throat> so when you look at this, uh, the yeah. So uh, I look at the, the dual picture here, I look at the hyperplanes. So first uh, I look at Psi or theta, this uh, with respect to alpha one. So, because this is alpha one, I have alpha one equal to zero here. And then uh, I have with respect to alpha two, I have 
something here, which is equal to zero. This is thirty degrees, and this is the origin here. So the way this was defined. <coughs> So I'll have alpha naught equal to zero here. So this is the plane the alpha naught equal to zero, which is alpha naught plus one. I'm looking at the alco half spaces coming from this. So the ones defined by this uh, bunch of basic affine roots. So you look at um, um, so this. So this will be right. So this because it will be like for this case it will be like this here, and here it will be like. <clears throat> hmm? So this is the this is the alcohol A, and so I'm looking at uh, psi alpha alpha one greater than equal to zero, alpha two zero, and zeros alpha one equal to Alpha two equal to zero. Right. Zero and <coughs> then I also have um, alpha naught is minus three alpha one minus two <coughs> alpha two plus one. And you can also find out, I mean, there are other things come and meet here, and all those can be written down here. You know, this is, this will be the alpha naught check. It was alpha naught was two. And uh, that's the co root given by the alpha. So this closure is the standard while alcohol. <coughs> and vertices are given as these. OK. So now I'll, um, let me just So with this, let's let's look at some more um, generalities because I require them. So, yeah, you, the, I mean these are getting translated all over the place. So I'm I'm basically cutting off. So you should have you have the usual chamber, and then it will be like cut off with this extra root, the alpha naught one, and that those are those will be the uh, the alcos, and you have a uh, the fundamental domain distributes the while the affine while group will distribute this across the plane. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, I would, I would I'm, I mean, one can draw. It's not too hard. At least, I mean, I'm, it'll take some some effort. But but this gives a complete picture already, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. Well, um, <laughs> yeah, maybe I can't even visualize. <laughs> so the 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 purpose. I mean, in some sense, I just wanted to mark out these. Uh, facets in these uh, vertices so that I can associate to them natural uh, groups which are going to come here. Okay, And that's, that's the reason why I defined these facets because these are the seven, in this case G2, the seven paraholic groups which come up and uh, they will have the information that I require for my uh, theory that I want to talk about. That's right. 
depending on the various facets. See, the interesting thing is that the open facets determine the same paraboloid groups. There's a, there a general theory would tell you that. So that's why I marked apart these, uh, these facets here and picks, picked up natural, some sort of weighted barycenters so that I can write out the stabilizers in a very easy way for these cases. <clears throat> so maybe just, let me just write down the, the <coughs> stabilizers in this case. So just in this case, this is, I think, psi 2 equal to half. Zero here. OK. And inside, so if you can easily check that inside this inside. For x in A, R, and R plus. Yeah. So let me write out this, the parahoric groups here and associate it to these barycenters. <coughs> the, 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 I've given the coordinates for the barycenters. So I have these, I have these facets given by the vanishing of these uh, affine, uh, affine roots here. Each, so these are the barycenters in this case, which are going to come in this, on these facets. There'll be the, the open facet here, which is the, which will, which will be given by the Ivahori. I'll talk about that. And then there are these other facets, and then there are these vertices. Each one will give you, I mean, for these, these are the barycenters themselves. For the other things, I'm just picking up some point, which will represent the open facet. So these, th these points, theta m, in each of those open facets are, will be used to write the stabilizers in a very canonical fashion. <clears throat> so, so this is what I want to do here. Pardon? So here, uh, in my diagram, so this, so as I said, these are the vertices, okay? And so the, you have to compute these numbers, HM, for each of these cases. So they are not necessarily middle point chairs, they are somewhere here, I mean, you'll have these points as points on the open facet given by these numbers, HM. These are not the, the barycenters in the usual sense. They are some, that's why I call them weighted barycenters in this sense. They come with this weight. Okay, so I have these roots, the, the vertices here, and I'm writing them as a linear combination of these. And I have to compute the numbers HM for each of these. So if you look at each of these facets, you can have, you can compute the number HM by just adding the, coefficients of the highest root which comes from there. So explicitly one can write on. I'm just giving the algorithm fully there. <clears throat> and to this, I associate the parahoric groups now. So, uh, yeah, sure. In the case when you define the alcoves mm -hmm. for a compact mm -hmm. the group, the alcove or uh, you can do it in terms of some part of the closure mm -hmm. parameterizes conjugacy classes. Absolutely, absolutely true. So, yeah, I mean, so I'll come back to that. <laughs> so, so you, I mean, uh, well, not the yeah. So if you if you if you work with the compact group and look at its Lie algebra, you can use the conjugacy classes for the other. So you can identify the alcove with the maximal torus model of the, the Weil group, or the Lie algebra of the maximal torus model of the affine Weil group. So that's one way of giving a parameterization for this. So I'll come back to that. I thought I'll, when I talk about my Fuchsian picture, I would naturally come to those finite conjugacy classes there, and I'll relate the points here at that time. So, so let me define these. So we are interested in a class of uh, subgroups 
of this group GK. This is the so-called, this K is, as a, if you remember, this was the loop group here up to conjugacy. Okay, I'm I'm going to define a set of. I mean, the the point is that I mean you have this naturally naturally defined finite collection of these special subgroups given by the facets, the barycenters of this alco, and this fundamental domain for the affine vial group here, and they up to conjugacy they are, they fully determine these parahoric groups, and I want to write them down explicitly. The whole idea of choosing these various centers and things like that was to uh, write this. So I take a point here <coughs> and define P theta of K to be the group generated by the, so my maximal torus T is all, so see I fix this, uh, when I fix this maximal torus, in some sense I'm fixing this so-called apartment so this is the apartment, <laughs> okay? And so fixing, I fix the wild chamber, I fix the affine roots in terms of the simple roots given by T and the Borel B. So I look at this, and I also have these, I'll define these groups now. I have the so-called root groups, and I change the entries of the root groups in terms of uh, the pairing that I've defined for you. So, so this is UR, Z to the power M, uh, theta A. A is my ring. A is C Z. Okay, so this is the torus defined over A here. So these are overall roots here. <coughs> Where M R theta is in terms of the greatest integer function, theta r, maybe this way, just minus r theta. So mr theta is the smallest, smallest integer such that r theta plus mr theta is greater than equal to zero every R in R. <clears throat> so I tweak. So what are these URs? So let's, so here I have to be, I mean, I, I'm not, there's something called the universal Chevalier group associated with this root system. So you, when you fix this T e and this Borel here, and G, you have the so-called unipotent radical of, uh, Sorry, so U is, is given inside this, okay? And uh, uh, then you have, once you have fixed these, so you have also these, it gives a family of uh, homomorphisms. Homomorphisms which are called the root homomorphisms from the additive group, which is just the, this, two G, R and R. And these are the so-called root homomorphisms. <clears throat> and the, the properties that all of them give you for the positive roots here, from product of GA to this. <clears throat> and these have nice properties here. So for each R, For each R, these homomorphisms from U R to D have there is for every for every uh, K algebra B oh sorry B T and T D <coughs> and C and B you can talk about T times U R of C times T inverse is U R of R T of C. Okay. 
So, so this, in some sense, you can define this functorially in terms of its valued points. That's what I'm saying here. And these will completely determine this. And they generate this group G. Uh, so there is a completely uh, uh, intrinsic way. I mean, you start with this root system and the set of simple roots. And you can define the so-called BN pairs associated with that. And you can define these. The, the, there is a universal Chevalier group construction over Z, which come up with these uh, root homomorphisms. And you can define these. So you, you have these subgroups. The, the image of this is what I call, so you have this UR of D sitting inside GD for each K algebra, given by the root homomorphisms. So, the pardon? The hmm? been fixed and I fixed. I fixed the alcohol. Yeah. No, here not. I mean, if, uh, for the def NGI, I, I wanted to talk about. I, I have not fixed the alcohol. I mean, I'm not fixed. Uh, I'm, I want to define the parahoric groups purely in terms of the root groups here. Okay. Oh, so far, you're not using the I've not used the alcohol. What I'm trying to say is, once, Sorry, see, once I choose these. Uh, once I have this definition for the choice of the facets, so the uh, weighted barycenters, you can express these groups completely in terms of uh, some sort of entries which are given purely in terms of those numbers mr theta is coming out of the, the barycenters. So I can choose the barycenters theta. So all I'm trying to say is once I have these groups p theta is defined in this fashion, for each of the weighted barycenters, I simply choose my groups p theta m's as my uh, distinct representatives of the parahorics. And you get all the conjugacy class. All the conjugacy class come out of that. So that is my basic representat representatives of the conjugacy class, which in the bundle theory that I wish to talk about in terms of uh, Fuchsian groups and representations, the, they pick up these parahorics canonically. So that's why I was setting up the algorithm for this purpose. I mean, this, I mean you could have made any choice. Basically, it's up to conjugacy. My special choice of representatives that I'm making is with a purpose. So once I have these theta m's now, so for each theta m, which are, in this case, for example, in G2, you have seven of them, you have these groups, E theta m's. So they give you the entire conjugacy class of the parahorics that I'm interested in. <clears throat> of course, you can talk about, you know, I mean, uh, so, so the basic e example of the parahoric a group that I'm thinking of here, the first one or the, so the, the, so the example that one can think of is the following. This is the so-called standard maximal parahoric inside GK, just the a valued point. So if you want to think matrix theoretically, it's just points here where no poles are allowed in my entries. And that's the, as we, the concept of a maximal parahoric will come in terms of stabilizers for the vertices of the while alco, they will be the maximal ones here. For example, this GA will turn out to be P0 of K, okay, the stabilizer of the, the origin here. And uh, if you want to go to the a standard parabolic subgroups which come in the usual root systems, you can take the the evaluation map from G to GK, which is, and here I can choose uh, the standard para, uh, uh, Borel subgroup here, which is already fixed. And I could also have chosen parabolic subgroups given by subsets. So I can take subsets I inside the set of simple roots here, okay? Indexing sets here. And to each indexing set, I can define the parabolic, which is, I call it the standard parabolic given by I. I can take the inverse image of that here, so that one can write down in terms of um, <coughs> the standard. So for example, if you take I to be a set of simple roots minus a single simple root alpha, so this, so I'll call this this, PK will be PA. In this case, it will be UR uh, generated by this, UR of A, where R sits inside this so called R uh, I union minus R plus minus R I. Where R I is roots. 
such as that theta alpha <coughs> is zero, i.e., the simple root alpha does not occur. So this is that means if you if you go to the if you if I work with the usual group G once I fix the Borel, I have these parabolic subgroups which contain the fixed Borel, and there is a usual way of indexing them as subsets of the set of simple roots. And if you take, for example, these are the maximal parabolics given by uh, uh, single simple roots, and then you can take the inverse image under the evaluation map, and you'll get subsets inside G A. So the, if you take the Borel here, <coughs> the, the inverse image of the Borel is what is called the Evahori, which is the given by, so I, I thought I'll write this down. <coughs> um, yeah. So if you take, if you take the, if you take uh, the Borel subgroup as a standard parabolic, the inverse image here is given by the barycenter of the open facet here, this one, which it's with weights given by one by the coxeter number, Hx, Hg. So that will be, <coughs> so this will be, I'll just call, let me call this the barycenter, so uh, theta, Theta G, let me call this. Okay. And this this is given by the barycenter, weighted barycenters. It's theta G is summation Ni by Hg. That's so these theta alpha is are given by the alpha, these vertices, and the you can write this barycenter here, which is what I call theta g. And the coxit number in this case is just six. So you have these coefficients which come here and <coughs> you can write the combination and you can choose the barycenter. So that parahoric associated to that will be the inverse image of the Borel under this standard map. Okay, so <clears throat> sorry. Thinking about something like GLN, mm -hmm. so or SLN. Um, so the standard things are like choosing a plan. Yes, exactly, exactly. So you choose a, you're specializing to the special type of, and you're looking at the flag. Here. That's right. So in in this, in the, if you take G to be GLN or SLN. I mean, um, if I fix the, the diagonal matrices and the upper triangle matrices, then I have the standard subgroups given by this picture here. Okay, so subgroups of this kind are the standard parabolics which contain the given upper triangular matrices here. Okay, and these, each one, if you look at the so-called maximal, the big ones that I've written down here, by choosing one simple root, that will be the so-called maximal parabolics, and the G mod P's will be the Grassmannians here, and the uh, we are looking at entries on the uh, lower half here, which will have poles now, okay? So yeah, basically, but when I put, no, in this case, there will be no poles because they are all sitting inside GA, but when I put Z equal to zero, <coughs> in these entries, I'll get the standard parabolics. That's the, that's the evaluation map. So this is just the inverse image of a standard parabolic inside this. So, hmm? so when I was here, I mean, I, the whole idea of talking about these special vertices and in indexing is that once I have uh, indexed my vertices in terms of the simple roots and the choice of these affine uh, roots here, then I have a canonical way of representing my parahorics in terms of its entries and what sort of entries are coming. And in each of the cases, I mean, it's a pretty simple exercise now. I mean, I've given an, I, even, even I could do it. I mean, I, I, that's how I do it, did it for myself. I mean, I wrote out these weighted barycenters so that I can write out these group uh, parahorics in each of these cases. And uh, but for GLN, you don't have any special, like, I mean, 
No, the, in, the GLN theory is a very interesting theory. Because in, GL, in the GLN case, one can prove that any parahoric is actually up to conjugacy coming and sitting inside GLN of A itself. So that's one of the reasons why in the, the, the so-called theory of parabolic vector bundles, you don't see the new objects called parahoric torsos. You see only so-called parabolic vector bundles. What I'm trying to say is in the case of, para, in, in the case of GLN, not SLN, in the case of G equal to GLN, you can prove that all the parahorics up to conjugacy are sitting inside GLN. This is some uh, classical, uh, what's it called, elementary device theory. Okay, we are working on a PID and you can look at matrices here and you can prove that all bounded subgroups contain a neighborhood fix are now going to come and sit inside up to conjugacy. So you're not really getting anything new except the standard parabolics in the case of GLN. The first thing that you start looking at is therefore SLN. And for SLN, you do get, so even in SLN, you don't get very, very striking things. It just so happens that the vertices of the while alcove <laughs> give you, the while alcove is very symmetric firstly, okay, it won't have this. So you'll have a picture of that kind, okay. And the corresponding vertices will give you uh, parahorics, which are what are called, see, because the coefficients, see, the, the mystery here is that the coefficients of the highest weight all uh, turn out to be one in the case of uh, SLN. So these NIs don't give you any extra information. In the case of G2, you have this, the, the so-called Dinkin diagram looks like this. You can draw it like this, this is alpha one, alpha two, and then there's the alpha naught here, minus alpha naught, and this will, the, each of these will give you the so-called maximal, these are the uh, minimal dimensional facets, therefore they'll give you the maximal hyperspecials. <coughs> and uh, uh, I, I mean, so if you look at the, if you look at this one and look at the, so the, 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 the algorithm is that you look at the extended Dinkin diagram to pick up the maximal hyperspecials. You, are, you for, for the case of SLN, you attach this minus alpha naught on the corner here. And then you have these standard ones, okay? And so this is alpha one to alpha L here. The usual parabolic subgroups are given in terms of omitting roots on this part here. Now you have this extra one. So the maximal hyperspecials are all given by the vertices. So this my, uh, vertex will give you the maximal hyperspecial GA that we have written out there. The other ones, when, in the case of SLN, if you, if you omit this, you take the, the new Dinkin diagram which is going to come out of this, which is again a copy of SLN. So all the ma maximal hyperspecials in the case of SLN then um, this is, these are called hyperspecial for the reason that the, I mean, I have not still come to the group scheme. The, there's, a, there's a natural group scheme associated to these parahorics, and the closed fiber of this group scheme at the maximal ideal, if that turns out to be reductive, then they're called hyperspecial vertices. In the case of SLN, all the maximal ones are hyperspecial in this sense. In the case of G2, <coughs> if you look at G2 as an example here, the, the maximal ones, there are three of them now. So if you look at this one, you'll get back the G, GA, which will give you the group G2 itself. But if you look at, if you omit this one, you'll get an SL2 cross SL2 as what is called the reductive piece inside the central fiber. So you have a group scheme, which is a non-reductive group scheme now. I'll, in the case of these uh, parahorics, I still not. So each of these parahoric groups that I've written down here, they're not to be giving you forms for the group. And uh, these group schemes will be defined on this spec of this, this ring here. At the maximal ideal, for the non-hyperspecial non cases, this, that fiber need not be reductive. But you can, if it's a, mac, if it's a vertex, then the so-called, if you kill the unipotent radical of the central fiber, you actually get something which is semi-simple. And that semi-simple groups, Dinkin diagram, has the algorithm that you can omit that particular vertex. And you get that. So these are the things, and for example, the other one will be an SL3 here. I mean, this, when I write an SL3 here, this will be the reductive part of that non-reductive central fiber. There'll be a large unipotent radical. For G2, you said before you get seven? Seven, in the G2 case. Can you tell us how do you get to seven? Yeah, so this, these, these three correspond to these, okay? And then you have these, so each, each of these, each of these facets, will give you one, and this will give you the Eva Hori. And the ones that basically are in the same class as the parabolic, 
Yeah, those are these two. Those which contain the origin, they will be the standard parabolics, and this extra one alone will be the distinctive one. So that's the picture. I mean, this will be the, this is the standard picture. So you have this. So I, the, the advantage of writing this diagram is that um, for, for the explicit purposes of where coordinates, in some sense, you know, when I'm choosing uh, matrices and unitary representations and things like that, you, all, you come up with the maximal torus, you fix a diagonal and do all that. Then all these things drop out as natural choices. And since I was talking in the context of uh, bundles, I thought it's a good idea to just parameterize them so canonically, so you can see them. And um, because the general theory, of course, is very vast. I don't need to make all these choices and things like that. <clears throat> Well, do I, I don't know. I mean, the standard parabolics came out much earlier, and therefore it is a natural, at the moment, Ibohori Matsumoto defined the affine weights, I mean, the affine roots and things like that. You have, a, so you can look at stabilizer subgroups of facets. So you can look at the, the, the way in which it is very, very canonically written is that you have this action of GK on the building, okay, and then you can look at uh, stabilizers of points there, and these stabilizers. And one proves that there are two conjugacy, they are determined by open facets, and then it's independent of which point you choose in the open facet. Therefore, you can choose a barricade. So it keeps coming down. And finally, what one is trying to say is that you have these maximal parahorics are essentially given by these, for example, theta alpha i's, okay, i going from, so these are the, these are the maximal parahorics, and then the other ones coming from the various facets. So each facet gives you a, a choice of a parahoric and up to conjugacy, the unique one. I assume G is simple and simple. So the alcove is a very simple, nice simplex like this. Otherwise, you'll have product of simplices and such things. <coughs> okay, so now let me, I don't know that I, I think I've overshot. Um, let me just get to some Fuchsian theory so that I'll tell you what is the reason. I have how much time? 10 minutes. Maybe I'll have to take a little bit from tomorrow also. Okay. I'll come to the group schemes tomorrow. But today I just wanted to say how this, <coughs> let me, so folks in. Very quickly, okay, definition. A Fuchsian group pi is a discrete subgroup of P SL2R. <coughs> and you know, this is, uh, it implies, or it's equal to the fact that pi acts on, of the upper half space acts as in automorphisms of H properly discontinuously on the upper aspects. <clears throat> okay? And since it's inside this, the Jordan canonical form tells you that each of these are conjugate to the following types. So they are they look like lambda lambda. 1, 0, lambda mu, 0, 0, lambda not equal to mu, and the first case, first case, it's obviously called the parabolic element, and the second one, <coughs> I say that second case, call this element, call it elliptic, if mod of okay. <clears throat> and it's called hyperbolic. Hyperbolic if it is real positive, this quotient, real positive, and it's called loxodrom loxodromic otherwise. Okay. So <clears throat> So I'll, I'll, I'm just going to concentrate on two cases. We, we are in two cases, so-called 
parabolic and elliptic situation. So <coughs> pi Fuchsian acting on the upper half space, a point, a point Z in H is called is called elliptic. It's called elliptic. If there exists an elliptic sigma n pi, such that sigma fixes it. And I call an, an S in the real part, including the point at infinity, is called a cusp of pi. It's called a cusp of pi if there exists a parabolic sigma, so that sigma s is s. <coughs> and the basic lemma in this theory, which is not too hard to prove, is that z elliptic point, then the stabilizer by z is a finite cyclic group. <coughs> and if S is a cusp, pi S is Z. Okay. And then you can look at this upper half space union the cusps of pi. And then this quotient dot pi is a Riemann surface, locally compact. <laughs> and it's compact it's compact <laughs> um, if uh, cusps of pi the cardinality is finite. In this case, in this case we say pi is a Fuchsian group of the first kind. <clears throat> okay, and that is I want this quotient to be compact. And in general these Fuchsian groups need not be finitely generated, but I am going to work in there are reasons which I'll come towards the end why it's enough to consider for the following case. So if 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 h mod pi itself is compact, then, <coughs> then this genus of this quotient of h mod pi is greater than or equal to 2, and pi has a presentation. There's a presentation which is standard now, a1, a2, ag, b1, b2, bg, c1, C2, cl, with the property that c1, m1, cl, ml, <coughs> equal to 1, and the other relation is equal to product of the commutators c1 up to cl. So this is the full presentation of this Fuchsian group into this case, okay? <clears throat> now I'm interested in the following picture. <clears throat> so I'm interested in homomorphisms or representations of this Fuchsian group. So I have this simple group and I also fix a maximal compact Kg in G. Compact in the case S U one is SLN. <coughs> and I'm looking at homomorphisms of this into the compact group. So here the context of the compact group automatically comes in. And there is a way of describing the Weilal curve purely in terms of conjugacy classes of points in the compact group. Okay. And uh, I also assume that pi has an elliptic, the elliptic type. Okay, I'm the objects of study that we are looking at 
Okay, I, so I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in the following objects. So when I look at a homomorphism from pi into k, which is inside g, it is the map into the, the maximal torus. X, X, I mean, I can choose the simple roots there, and it, I can express any homomorphism in terms of the choice of the simple roots, the basis here. Yeah. And so that I fix, I, when I fix this representation, I can talk about the type in term. So once once S is fixed, S means a set of simple roots, then I can talk about the type of row. And following the traditions of Narsimhan, Seshadri, Andreve, and all these people, I'll denote the type by toe. And we are interested in the following object, at least the first part. I'll call it R tau pi kg modulo kg, where this as a set of homomorphisms with fixed type tau modulo this action by conjugacy. Conjugacy classes or representations. So I just want to look at what the objects look like. <clears throat> Associated to a representation, I can, def uh, I can define very gently, first I can define what is a pi g bundle. <clears throat> so, so let p be a trivial bundle. Am I through with my time? <laughs> maybe this is a maybe this is a good point to stop. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I should have gone a little faster, maybe, or maybe I did go fast. You know, I just wanted to quickly say that, I mean, is, is the whole story is like this. So I have the upper half space here, and I'm already looking at this. I'm assuming that my pi has only elliptic fixed points. There's no cusps. So that means h mod pi itself is compact. And then there is something called the Selberg lemma, which I want to mention here, which tells you that <coughs> given such a group, OK? Uh, with a presentation like this, which is a finitely generated group, you can always get a, a subgroup of finite index which acts freely on, on H, and this will be like a finite ramified uh, covering, and the ramifications will be precisely the points where the elliptic fixed points are there. The images of those points will come here. So you'll have a marked points here, and the whole theory then is to understand how to associate torsors for certain group schemes to such, to such data, and uh, how to get rid of the group scheme and the parahodics completely from this, such a ramified cover. Okay, that's the, 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 the goal. And to, so once this representations are written down and these, these ramified covers are written down, so see, one can then work with the so-called objects which are, I mean, principal bundles on this, on this, on this Riemann surface. So here, there'll be a finite group which is going to act now, which is called gamma. So this is my pi here, and there'll be some pi naught, which is a subgroup of finite index. And this is the quotient, which is going to act here. This is going to have some fixed points, marked points here. And um, the, if you look at a, a, a p here, which is now a gamma g bundle, which means a principal g bundle together with the lift of the gamma action here, then um, one can actually um, analyze what's happening in the uh, et al neighborhood or the analytic neighborhood of a fixed point inside y. And the, the whole theory of parahorics that I defined can completely be written down in terms of this, this, is this study here. And every parahoric which could occur in, in our uh, the situation where A is CZ can be recovered from this theory. And not only that, the Bruhatitz group scheme that we are going to talk about can also be recovered from this, from this covering completely. So the whole uh, theory of Bruhatitz group scheme associated to those parahorics is completely recoverable from this geometry of this ramified covering. That's the goal. And tomorrow in the first half an hour, 40 minutes, I'll talk about this and tell the main theorem. Thank you. Let's thank uh, Balaji for his <laughs> Questions? 
is the is the theta that occurred that was right around here somewhere is that the thing which in the parahoric case corresponds to the parabolic weight in the that's right the usual parabolic bundle case yeah so that I, I will in the case of when I finally come down to the last expressions I will completely take the JLN case and write out the the way in which these thetas can be written purely in terms of those alpha is which come in the parabola so there is a way of writing these uh, so the, uh, the the dictionary I'll express it tomorrow in the my talk. That is, given these thetas, which I spoke about in the weil alcove picture, you can express it completely in terms of the standard weights between 0 and 1, which Seshadri, Mehta Seshadri write. So there's a, there's a right. And can you, can you view that as in some way as uh, sort of a growth rate of a metric? I mean, uh, a metric being a compact reduction mm -hmm. bundle. Can you, can you view the theta as being sort of the asymptotic? Yes, uh, yes. Um, in some sense, we did that in my paper with uh, Ms. Vas and Yashwanidhi. There is a way of relating these things to the differential geometry problem there, and can do that. But uh, so, so one has to therefore handle the so-called real weights problem there, because more general theory should take care of that too. And uh, here, this picture will take care of only the rational weight scenario, because I'm using this elliptic fixed points. But one can do it for the real weights case with a, a small twist, and one can do that, yeah. More questions? Last part of my talk tomorrow, last 45 minutes hopefully, will tell you why I'm right now interested in this, where this has more ramifications. Great. I look forward to that. If there are no more questions, and let's thank Balaji again. And we'll meet again at 11 for Oscar Garcia Prada's first talk on Higgs bundles and higher technical components.